best possible outcome from the, well, I'm aiming for 20, 25 minutes, so maybe the coffee might be ready this time, is that by the end of my talk, people say, oh, that's nothing new, we do that. Or you're talking to other people in the room about what you do in your own schools. So I'll just kick off with this. Knowing that many people can multitask the fairer sex better than the other, apparently, um, then you know, some of you might have this running away in the background or sort of trying to work out what the song was, and I'll be impressed if anybody can get the year when we ask the question at the end. Moving on, though, the, it's this idea of, as Mary was saying, a lot of the things that are involved in Curriculum for Excellence we're probably already doing at the moment. And so I'm just going to run through our second year science course here at Melbourne, why we revised the course what we've kept the same, what we've changed, and some of the new activities that we've introduced, some of the views of pupils who've used the course and teachers who've taught the course, and finally, trying to tie this into Curriculum for Excellence, how it actually uh, is, in our view, a Curriculum for Excellence. If you remember, Curriculum for Excellence used to be a Curriculum for Excellence. It's now the Curriculum for Excellence. And it, when it was ACE, we had a lot of blue sky thinking at Melbourne Academy. The senior management team were very good at just letting us sort of wool gather and say, well, what would be your best possible outcome from this new curriculum? What would you really like from it? And we've um, been very receptive to a lot of teachers' ideas. We've been involved in cross-curricular projects. There's six different projects running, which are being coordinated between departments in the school, ranging from the Holocaust to athletics and all sorts of things which can, and healthy living, which can transcend these subject boundaries. We've had special one-day events like Springboard Challenge, which might be in some schools, or the Wind Power Day, which the technology staff are hearing about over on the other side of the building. We haven't done anything with changing age or stage uh, requirements. Uh, we make choices at the end of second year, and there's just generally standard grades rather than intermediate ones or twos in third and fourth. So it's really quite a traditional curriculum that we're working in. Um, so, we, we talked about ACE in the past, and that was often seen as being the death of a secondary subject. Everything was going to become a mishmash, and so it was, maybe it was the ACE of spades for secondary subject teaching. They were going to lose our science that we're so passionate about, and a lot of children are so passionate about, in this greater holistic learning. So, we'll come back to that, but do you ever feel with your second years, or with a lot of your year groups, you're trying to take them somewhere that they don't want to go? As Mary was saying, always this push to get through something. So that was a sort of common thread that we were trying to avoid with anything that we're doing in second year. The reasons that we went back to a second year science course, it, we would, the, the particular course that we were running at the time had a very poor uh, motivation both for pupils and staff. It was a very, very traditional style of course. We were finding an, an awful skew in terms of what subjects people were taking in third year. And that was based on an ignorance of what was in the three separate subjects. There was a really a lack of challenge, and this is something which HMIE will constantly tell any in school that they inspect, that second years aren't being pushed, or there isn't enough sort of difference, uh, differentiation in second year. We felt that because it was a traditional course, there was a lack of everyday relevance for second year pupils. And with the department has actually gone to faculty head, faculty status, and I'm head of the faculty head of science, which has many drawbacks, and if anybody's being encouraged into that position, I would, you know, it's worth talking to me because it's got some drawbacks as well as some good points. But one of the good points is that it does allow the three separate subjects to coordinate and to develop a common course in first and second year a lot more coherently. So we took it from a lot of the literature that was already out there, advice from HMIE, these publications which come out quite often, and also from the Curriculum for Excellence, the early documents, the early hints that there were. Our second year course evolved before these outcomes, which you now have, which Mary's asking for engagement with. So that really, we were talking about process rather than content. The way we've restructured the second year course is that from August to January, we do three straight biology, physics, and chemistry units. They're taught by scientists, so you could have a biology teacher teaching the physics unit, but it really gives the 
pupils a flavor of what they've got ahead of them in intermediate or standard grade. So that's up until January. As we all know, post-January or in that spring term, the marks are in, the ch course choices are made, and motivation can take a dive in some cases. So for January to May, we've made the units shorter, and um, we use the ideas of Curriculum for Excellence to keep that motivation and interest up with, although there is assessment, so they don't lose the, lose the, the habit of getting assessed in science, the assessment was minimal by comparison. So the four units that we used, uh, Chem, Myth, Try, um, which main man on camera this morning, Andy Hay, came up with the idea for. I take uh, the blame for the title, unfortunately. But Andy was talking about the, some of the myths in science that there are and the critical thinking that goes behind exploding some of these myths. So we'll come back to that in a moment, hence the title, Chem, Myth, Try. Global Greenhouse is obviously to do with global warming and climate change. Biotechnology is the sort of science that we're always seeing on the news, petri dishes and gene therapy and that sort of biotechnology. And lastly, forced emotion, whereas the bits that we feel that second years enjoy most from actually making things move and dropping things and things like that. Now, before you go any further, it's worth pointing out this has got nothing to do with 5 to 14, what we're doing in, sec in second year. We just, if we were to inspect it at the moment, the inspector came and said, oh, D, you're not doing your level E and F. We'd say, well, we're not. So um, we've really ripped up 5 to 14 environmental studies. Things that we've kept the same is it's very practical. There's a lot of practical work. Some of the best practical activities we've tried to retain. So the favorite things that we know work and that pupils enjoy, we know there's a lot of value added learning in, we've retained. They still slotted into, we're running on 40 minute periods, so we do two 80 minute periods a week. So we've kept within that structure and we've still been able to um, work a curriculum for excellence style learning. And secondly, and lastly, the, the pupils are still definitely having to think hard about the science, going into depth rather than breadth across the subject. The sort of features that we've built in with Curriculum for Excellence is that we've obviously had to build on the experience in primary. We often have secondary teachers going into the primaries and finding out what's going on in the primary schools, talking to primary colleagues, not only about the content that they, uh, they've got in their science lessons, but also the way that they're teaching it. We're trying to use a lot more formative assessment at Melbourne. Formative assessment has been a grassroots bottom-up movement with a lot of practitioners and lead practitioners um, sp spreading ideas, and that's been very much the case in science. We're using open-ended investigative work, as Mary was pointing out, making sure the pupils have a very open choice of variables, and it's their investigation rather than something that's been thrust upon them. We're using collaborative working, which, for those of you who know, the jigsaw technique from AIFL, where a collection of groups will take a different aspect of the work and bring their findings to the whole group, to the whole class, so everybody does a little bit, and then the final picture is only made up when everybody brings their own bit of the jigsaw. The core content was actually quite light, in that there's not a lot of learning outcomes as you would, there's not as many learning outcomes as you would see in a traditional first or second year course. We've tried to engage in these cross-curricular projects, been talking to uh, colleagues in home economics, or art, or PE, about what they're doing with the science that we're teaching, uh, or what we can do to cooperate with them. We try to always link to current events and things that are happening in society, what's in the children's everyday world, apart from what was in a science textbook 20 years ago. Lastly, there's always some kind of product or an artifact, something which we can let the pupils or can be shown off at the end of the, the learning. So I think this sort of idea that you've got something to show what, for what you've been doing can be very motivating, motivating for the pupils. I'm going to run through five activities that we've got in the second year course. If, if you want to know more in depth about it, and that's the good and the bad, because it's, it's not all plain sailing with this kind of activities, uh, talk to any of this, the teachers from Melbourne here today. But I'm going to run through all about yeast applications and cultures from the biotechnology unit talking about the evidence for global warming, about hovercraft batteries, and then the, the legal case between Re Rapunzel and Pantene Pro-V shampoo.